Thank you for joining us today for Change the World with COLA. I'm Tony Weber, and I'm a gift planner for the College of Liberal Arts, meaning that I work with our donors to help them find the smartest ways to make gifts, gifts to UT, including through their estate. And today, we'll be talking about our supporters who have made gifts to UT through their wills and estate plans, how and why they do it, and how those gifts strengthen the college and go on to change the world. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat throughout the webinar, and we'll try to get all, to all of them at the end of, at the end of our session. When, uh, when we have time for that. To start, I'm honored to introduce uh, Anne Huff Stevens, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. She's going to give us a brief update on where we're headed after the uh, last very unusual year we've, we've been through. Dean Stevens. All right, thanks Tony and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, it's great to have a, a little bit of time to talk with you all and to, to meet um, some of our donors and friends and, and uh, beneficiaries of some of the gifts over the years. So, you know, Tony mentioned that it's been a, we've had a few things on our plate over the past year, year and a half or so. And it's true that um, I was, uh, I had spent about eight months here at the College of Liberal Arts at UT when the pandemic hit. And so I'm definitely now have been at UT in more pandemic months than non-pandemic months, but I feel that that, um, account is going to shift soon. So we're all feeling a lot of optimism and kind of looking forward to the fall where I think uh, in our president's terms, we'll be back to something that's like a near normal. Um, but things are going well and we, um, you know, we continue during, during challenging times. I think it's especially important that we have those extra resources to support our students whose families may be struggling to support our faculty who have had a lot of uh, increased workload and, and new concerns and new things they've had to learn. And so a lot of what's really propelled us through has been based on gifts of, of donors past and present, and in many cases from planned gifts. And so we uh, continue to just be so appreciative of those and, and literally benefit from them every single day. Um, I know that many of you who are listening in today have already um, participated in this, have already included the college uh, or other parts of UT in your plans. And we're just always incredibly grateful and um, appreciate those so much. Um, so with that, I think um, Tony will, I believe, introduce our next segment and we'll have a couple of, of parts to this presentation today and I'll, I'll follow Tony's wise guidance here. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Stevens. Yes. Uh... Our next guest uh, who will be speaking to Dean Stevens today is Austin Ligon. Austin is an alumnus of Plan 2, and he also earned his master's in economics here on the 40 acres. And uh, more than many alumni that I've met, uh, Austin exemplifies the, the saying, what starts here changes the world. Over his career, he has helped found and build uh, a number of companies. Uh, most notably, he was the co-founder of CarMax. And through that time, he's created tens of thousands of jobs for people. Uh, and currently, he's on the board of Rev. It's a startup focused on transcription. Um, and today, he'll be speaking with Dean Stevens about his own plan gift. Welcome, Austin. It would be good to unmute, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Austin, for, uh, for taking some time to talk this morning. So, you know, let's just start by getting a little bit caught up. We've all had ways of coping during the pandemic. So tell us what you've been up to during these past months. Um, well, let's see. Uh, I celebrated the first time since 1972 that I have not flown outside the United States. And um, I only gotten on an airplane twice in the last 14 months. And normally, uh, even in my reduced flying around schedule, I'd be on a plane once or twice a month for sure. So that, that's been kind of interesting. Uh, but in terms of, and so I've been running a lot more, exercising a lot. My wife's a painter. Uh, she's the only person who really likes COVID because she paints eight hours a day and nobody bugs her. Um, but I, a lot of, what I would have done anyway, I've been doing just in formats like this. So I do a lot of Zoom calls just like you do. Right. Yes, exactly. We've all adapted and this is the new way. I actually bought an airline ticket a couple of days ago. I wasn't sure I remembered how to do it, but yeah. it worked out okay. So yeah, I'll get back to flying a little bit soon too. 
So I, I know there's an old adage. I think it normally applies only to attorneys where you're told, be careful about asking questions you don't know the answer to. But in a, in a forum like this, I think it's okay. So I've been told I should ask you about being mayor of the moon and what that's all about. Yeah, so um, that's almost right. Uh, when I applied to plan two, you had to write an essay about what you expected to be doing in, I don't remember, 20 or 30 years or something like that. And the, uh, uh, I talked to some students yesterday and they asked me, how, how clear were you on your plans? And I said, uh, I had no idea, you know, just absolutely no idea. And so my essay, I said, oh, in 25 years, I'll probably be governor of the moon. And I wrote an essay about being governor of the moon. And, um, you know, uh, as credit to plan two, they accepted me anyway, you know, it was uh, uh, sort of extraordinary, but um, obviously the moon has been skipped over. Elon Musk is planning to be president of, of Mars and Jeff Bezos is racing him toward it. So sounds like I'm out of the race. I think, I think maybe you've chosen well to sit that one out. Um, <laughs> though I'm sure you could take them if you wanted to. Uh, well. <laughs> most most people I give no give no way to, but when it comes to Elon Musk, he's sufficiently insane and sufficiently brilliant. I don't know, you know. Fair enough. So you talked about your your background as a Plan Two student and graduate, and um, Tony mentioned your your master's degree from economics here. And so after this liberal arts background, you've gone on to some extraordinary success. Um, I will confess, I. In addition to buying a plane ticket, I may have been looking at the CarMax website recently, Good. thinking about a purchase. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> and, um, and you know, today you're building a new company, working with Rev. Could you say a little bit about how you think about your UT education and your background and how those have helped you in, in all these pursuits you've, you've had success in? Yeah, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of divide it into two chunks because the Plan 2 program, as I started it, was all about breadth. You know, I mean, the reason I signed up for plan two, as soon as I saw about it was you can take one, you have a bunch of classes that nobody else gets to take only for plan two students. How great is that? And because they recruit a pretty strong group of students, you get some of the very best professors at the university to come teach you in uh, relatively small classes. I never had a TA in a plan two class. Uh, and even though I was we didn't call them TAs. I was a teaching fellow in economics and I have a high regard for teaching fellows. I was a great teaching fellow, but uh, it's great to have, you know, leading faculty. And I got to take not only um, uh, core courses like, you know, English uh, uh, and philosophy, philosophy under John Silver, who was the Dean at that time of the combined arts and sciences. Um, but I, I also got to take courses that you'd have never thought of otherwise, like Oud music of North Africa and the Middle East and uh, land reform in Uttar Pradesh. I remember my friends who were engineers asking me, you get credit for that? And where is Uttar Pradesh? Uh, now, uh, we didn't know as much about India in those days, but the breadth of what I got to study uh, at Plan 2 was extraordinary. And then uh, toward the end of my period in Plan 2, I started to focus on political science, did some work with a couple of political scientists who said, you know, you should really be an economist. And so I wandered over to the economics department, uh, started taking a few courses, and I had thought I was going to go to law school because, you know, the traditional thing, if you're liberal arts and you make good grades and you make high scores and you don't know what you want to do, you go to law school. And I am continuously, uh, sorry, anybody from the law school, I'm continuously advising people, don't go to law school because you don't know what else to do. Or if you do, do a joint degree program where you get a degree in economics or a degree, uh, an MBA, but um, don't hem yourself into law, into a profession where you may make a lot of money, but not really like it unless you really know what you want to do. Um, and I didn't, so I got accepted, didn't go to law school, went to the economics graduate school and um, it really sharpened my discipline of thinking. Um, I had to, it, it was much more quantitative than most of what I had been doing before. I had to take a couple of courses in econometrics and, and really do um, a, a lot of quantitative reasoning. And 
I was just a master's student because I didn't intend to get a PhD. I, I just wanted to hang around UT for a while back in the Armadillo World Headquarters days. But, um, but it gave me a chance to really uh, connect with people who were uh, PhD students and faculty that were completely serious about what they were doing, uh, really focused and working at a much higher level. So it was mainly, it, it sharpened my analytical abilities and it uh, gave me a good perspective for uh, what I would call Keynesian or post-Keynesian economics, which for about 30 years fell out of favor and nobody wanted to talk about it. And suddenly, guess what? It rules the world again. So, you know, uh, it's come back. So, um, uh, but it was a, a first experience at serious graduate work is really enlightening and it, it helps you understand one, do you want to be an academic or not? And, um, and I was fairly sure after that I, I didn't, I enjoyed the experience, but I, I was just too impatient uh, to sort of be an academic. So, yeah. um, but it, it, it was a great foundation for everything else I would do. And, and I can tell you when I went on to get an MBA, I mean, I, I already knew half the stuff. Uh, it's kind of like finance is rule of thumbs for MBA for economists, uh, you know, the, what they teach you in finance. So it was, it made getting an MBA a lot faster and made it a lot easier and uh, probably helped me do better. Excellent. So you talked uh, about what you got from plan two and I know that you've included support for the plan two program in your will. Can you say yeah. a little bit about that gift and, and how you structured that? Well, um, when, when I um, got to the point that I was ready to retire, um, I started to think about uh, taking advantage of, of uh, some of the opportunities to make gifts. And um, I had been contacted by somebody uh, at UT. I think I've told you before, it actually was somebody from the Macomb School, which I never had anything to do with. They didn't exist. And, uh, but um, I got involved with Plan 2, made a travel grant uh, uh, gift to them and have gotten more and more involved with Plan 2 because basically I couldn't have gone to university without the University of Texas being affordable mm -hmm. and to get exposed to world-class professors, get a world-class education um, at an affordable price, really, as I look back on it, was foundational to everything I was ever able to achieve. And if I owe anybody everything, um, it's it's the University of Texas in general, but really plan to as a program. Uh, and, um, you know, as Jason knows, I've done, I've done some things for economics, but it's really plan to that I'd like to see um, when, you know, uh, when I shuffle off this mortal coil. Uh, I'm, as you know, I'm not a big believer in endowment gifts before estate planning, but once you're going to be gone, I think the University of Texas will be as good a caretaker of your money as anyone since they uh, live forever and don't pay taxes. So, you know, it's a, it's, and, and there's just plan two works on a shoestring. It does amazing things with a shoestring. And so a, a modest gift like mine can actually make a pretty good difference. And I made it in the form of a flexible gift for the, for the plan two program director, because having worked, I've been on somewhere between nine and 10 university boards of different sorts. Uh, I know that there is nothing better than flexible money, uh, because most money is not flexible. And having some money that you can choose what to do with makes all the difference. And, and I, every, every Plan 2 director I've ever known has been an extraordinary person that I trust. So, you know, it, it has a good history there. And uh, there'll be Plan 2 directors I'll never get to know after I'm gone, but um, I know that they'll use the money well. Yeah. Thanks. They absolutely, that will be appreciated for a long time. So. How did you get, can you, can you say a little bit about how you got from this decision to, that you wanted to support plan to, what was the process like that led you then to, to put the gift in place and who did you work with and what did that look like? Well, I'm, uh, I, I basically called um, Angie, I think it was, and in your office and said, I'm, you know, thinking of doing this. Um, in fact, I'm trying to remember, I may have already done it. <laughs> One of the things I didn't really pay much attention to, uh, I did the same thing with Yale. I went ahead and put them in my will and didn't bother to tell them. And they were shocked when they found out about it because you know I hadn't properly documented it or anything. 
And I can't remember whether talking to Angie came first or, or whether my decision to do it, but um, we certainly ended up talking about it, uh, making it um, uh, making it more formal, putting it in the right legal structure. Uh, I think Tony was also very helpful on that. And, you know, is, is uh, the, the way I wanted to do it was a little more complex than most, but they figured that out and made it really easy. And, and so uh, it's, it's something that's easy to do. And as you know, most people who graduate from university will end up being worth more than they think they will be um, uh, when they pass away. And uh, putting the University of Texas in your will, uh, really as soon as you make one, which hopefully will be you know, fairly early in life and you're even in your 40s, um, is a good thing to do because uh, other people will come along and ask, but if you feel like I do and that you really owe that your your foundation bricks are University of Texas bricks, then having them be one of the first places that gets something uh, when you're gone is really important. And it was a super easy process. Oh, that's great to hear. So as I think about you uh, putting this gift in, which will establish an endowment, I come back to your you're, you obviously are a future-oriented person. We know that from your plan two application. So when you think about, you know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, that that endowment will still be um, contributing and supporting, what, can you imagine what that will do? Do you ever think about that, what it will do that far in the future and what types of students might benefit? Yeah. yeah uh... Honestly, I don't, <laughs> you know, it would be great, great to say that I look that far out in the future, but I, I had the great fortune to spend a year at the university as part of the Tower Fellows Program, which I'll put a plug in. If you're someone looking to change careers or at the end of your career, looking to redefine your life, um, the Tower Fellows Program is great. And so I got to spend a lot of time in undergraduate classes because we took regular classes and I met a lot of 19 and 20 year old, uh, 21 year old UT folks, and they were great. So they're, they're much more sophisticated and worldly and cosmopolitan than we were when I was at UT. Um, and, you know, they're somewhat more career driven, but a lot of them are doing interesting, crazy things, which I'm always in favor of. And the, some of the ones who know the most interesting, crazy things, I guess that's what I'd say in 50 years, the people doing many of the craziest things will still be plan two students. And so the money will be going to good use there because yeah. it's, a it's a natural home that attracts people that wanna go their own way and sort of make their own path. And particularly today where the flexibility is, you know, you can be plan two in engineering, plan two in honors business, uh, plan two in geophysics. I know people in all those areas yeah. um, and, uh, but you can also be plan to and decide you want to go deep into the archives in Cordoba in Argentina and study the interaction between the Jesuits and the natives. So uh, I think it'll be folks like that. Yeah, I'm sure you're right. All right. So now I want to thank so much for, for talking through that, that important gift. Um, I think Tony and Michelle are going to take over again and uh, have an announcement of some excited, exciting new approach. So go ahead. Yes. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Austin. Thank you, Dean Stevens. Uh, before we move on, I, I, as Dean Stevens mentioned, I'm going to uh, introduce my colleague, Michelle DeBellock. Michelle recently joined me here on the 40 Acres as, as one of my fellow gift planners, and she's going to be announcing a special new opportunity that we are launching here for the College of Liberal Arts today. So this is the, this is the first group that's learning about it, and we hope that uh, it's exciting for, as exciting for you all as it is for us. Michelle? Thank you. So uh, first, it's a great pleasure to be here in Texas, moved here from Ohio. So I have been accused of bringing the snow for which I apologize. I will tell you it wasn't as bad in Cleveland this year. So I think we got it here. Uh, when I came, Tony and I spent a lot of time talking about some interesting and engaging ways we could be working on plan giving. So it is my great pleasure to announce that for the first time at the University of Texas across the entire campus, the College of Liberal Arts is going to be running a legacy campaign, a legacy challenge in which if you document a new planned gift of $100,000 or more, we will immediately make a donation of at least $2,500 to the program or project of your choice. 
If you have heard of these before, you may have heard of them at George Washington or the Holocaust Museum. And the goal is that we want people who have maybe been considering doing a planned gift like Mr. Ligon or have had it in their mind's eye as they're, I know a lot of people, particularly during the pandemic, have really been looking at their estate planning, that this is a great way to get a lovely immediate benefit for any program or project to COLA that you're interested in. And you know, document your gift so that we have a record of that moving forward. The simplest way to put this is basically for the cost of a signature, you get an immediate gift of $2,500, which those funds are coming from $50,000, which was donated by both COLA and a donor, so that we have up to $50,000 to do this match. Um, certainly one of the things we want to let everyone know is that this is a really, again, it's the first time at UT, all eyes are on us. So this is a bit of a, um, a great thing, but it's a bit of a first come first serve because once those $50,000 are committed, we will, um, we're not sure we'll be able to get more money to commit to it. And as of today, we have a quarter of those dollars already committed to immediate donations. The other thing I want to let you know is that if you make a gift beyond $250,000, and again, just documenting with a signature and email saying, hey, I have included University of Texas and COLA in my estate plans, that gift, anything over $250,000 will be matched up to 1% for a total topping out at $10,000. So for instance, if you document a gift of $335,000, that would be an immediate gift of $3,000. $335. <laughs> and again, the only limitation on where these dollars can go is that they couldn't be used to set up, the, the immediate dollars could not be used to set up an endowment. You could make your planned gift do that, but the immediate dollars need to go to a currently existing program. Um, we are, Tony and I are more than happy to answer any questions about this regarding the campaign, regarding general planned giving related questions. We're here, we're excited to work with you. And I believe we've already done it, but we're posting a link in the chat for everyone to the Legacy Challenge. We've tried to make this as easy as possible. You can truly click the link, you know, quickly in less than five minutes, fill everything out and document your gift. And then we will reach out directly to you to see where you'd like those matching funds to go. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I would just add one note. Um, many alumni that we talk to, uh, and we hear that you're concerned about the fact that you can't really be sure of how much the gift is ultimately going to be to the university. And I just want everyone to know that we truly do understand and appreciate that concern. The future is, uh, as we all know, uncertain. I mean, if you look back at December 2019, nobody would have expected the 2020 we had. Um, and so we, we, tr we certainly do understand that. And, but what's important is to, that I want you all to know is that the university is, act, university is actually very comfortable with that uncertainty. And that by documenting your gift, you really are benefiting the, uh, the college and the programs that you care about today. Because um, not only, you know, in, in this case, we have this, this challenge, which really does provide uh, literal funding immediately for the, for the program that you care most about, but also uh, it's a very important, uh, uh, mark of approval, a mark of strength for those programs uh, when, when we know that there are gift plans coming in that will support them. And when we know that there are alumni and friends of the university that feel so strongly about a program that they're willing to put them, put that program into their will where they also have their family and their very closest friends and their church and whatnot. So that, I just wanted to, to share that uh, perspective on how we view uh, gifts that are, that, that are documented with us. Uh, moving forward today, I want to introduce our last guest to join us. Our last guest is Dr. Jason Abervea. Dr. Abervea is the chair of the Department of Economics, which has seen tremendous success, tremendous success under his leadership. And he holds the Murray S. Johnson Chair in Economics. He'll be talking with Dean Stevens about the impact that gift plans have, from our alumni have had on his own work here at, at UT. Thank you for joining, joining us, Dr. Abervea. Great. Thanks for having me. Yes. Great to, to see you and talk to you, Jason. We don't usually have an audience when we have conversations. Yeah, that's true. But, uh, Jason is one of our very um, highly valued department chairs in the college, and I always enjoy working with him. Um, so let's just start out, Jason. Maybe you could say a little bit about the Department of Economics, its growth, its recent successes, and just how things have gone over the last few years as you've, as you've led the department. 
Sure, happy to do so. Um, so I've been department chair now for 10 years. So a lot, a lot has happened, a lot of good stuff. Uh, actually, today was a very big day for us. Uh, we jumped in the US News uh, World Report rankings from 27 to 21 among all departments in the United States. So that was very, very big news for us. Um, and I think it's, it's basically a measure of, of all the things that have gone on over the past few years. Um, so I could talk for hours about this, but I'll, I'll just try and limit it to a couple of minutes uh, to focus on some of the big things that we've done. Um, so obviously faculty recruiting has been a huge, um, has been a huge initiative for us. Um, before I became chair, we, we hit a low watermark of about 21 research faculty. We're now closer to the mid thirties. So we've, we've increased over 50% in faculty size. Um, we've hired tenured faculty members away from higher rank places like Michigan and Wharton, which has been amazing. Um, and I should say, um, Austin talked about flexible gifts. Um, any of the things that I'm gonna talk about today as department chair, um, almost none of them would have been possible with, without the generosity of supporters who provided flexible gifts um, for our department. Um, so in addition to faculty, um, We've been supporting our graduate students a lot more. Um, so over the last few years, with the help of the college um, and also from revenues we've generated from our master's program, uh, we've increased stipends by about 30% for all of our PhD students across the board, um, which has been um, really great um, and also necessary with the cost of living going up in Austin uh, for us to be able to attract students. Um, we've redoubled efforts uh, in focusing on the placement of our graduate students. So we, we regularly place 100% of our students in uh, jobs that are directly related to their degree. <clears throat> um, and we've had some amazing placements. So we, we've placed students at Columbia and Princeton and recently UCLA. Um, and we've done great things with that alumni network as well. We started from nothing 10 years ago, um, and now we've got an advisory board. We've got a robust alumni mentoring program. We've got lots and lots of supporters. Um, so th there's great stuff that's going on with the, with the help of our alumni as well. Thanks. Yes, congratulations on that, that jump in the rankings. Very well deserved. Um, so in addition, in, uh, in along with serving as department chair, you are also the holder of the Murray S. Johnson Chair in Economics. Could you say a little bit about what that's meant for you and what it's made possible for your own uh, research support? Sure. So the, the Murray S. Johnson Chair is actually a bit unique. So it, it both supports um, my research as a faculty member, um, and especially as chair has allowed me to do things like hire research assistants um, and, and pay for data sets and, and do a lot of the things that have really enabled me to continue my work while I've been department chair. Um, at the same time, um, this particular endowment um, is also really a departmental endowment, um, meaning that it provides very flexible support um, that the department chair can use at you know, his or her discretion in terms of directing dollars to um, particular initiatives. Um, so that, that has been super valuable to us. Uh, in terms of my own research, um, actually, one of the reasons I came to UT in the first place um, was, was not the Murray S. Johnson chair, but it was, it was another chair that I received uh, when I was hired here. Um, and to be honest, it just made my research life a lot easier and much, much more productive than the place I had come from. Um, so the place I had come from, I was actually in a business school, but the research support was, was not that robust. And because of that, I had to spend a lot more time kind of chasing even small grants of $5,000 and spending a lot of time doing that grant work rather than doing the research itself. 
Um, so once I was able to get here, um, I could jump in, I could use money to purchase data that wasn't super expensive, but you know, it was too expensive for me to pay out of my pocket. Um, and then I could also hire graduate students directly using uh, from funds from the professorship. That's great. Were there any unexpected ways over the years that you've been able to use that funding? Um, any kind of unexpected side effects that you've gotten from holding that chair? Uh, well, like you, I'm an economist. So <laughs> there, there, are, there are kind of two things I think about in terms of using funding, both, both with my professor hat on, but also with my department chair hat on. Um, so the two things are what, what I call the trickle down economics of endowments um, and then the multiplier effect of endowments. Um, and hopefully any use of the money um, has at least one of those aspects to it. So a trickle down effect would be something like um, money trickling down from a professorship down to support graduate students or undergraduate students. Um, or from a departmental endowment to <clears throat> benefit faculty or students. Um, the multiplier effect, in my mind at least, is can we use this money in a way that's going to generate extra money for the department or the college, whether it's from outside funding uh, organizations um, or from additional support from alumni. So I'll give just one example, um, we piloted uh, a program called the Undergraduate Research Apprenticeship Program last spring, spring 2020, seems like 10 years ago, but <laughs> it was just last spring. Uh, so in this program, basically, we, we have doctoral students um, propose projects that come from their dissertation research um, for which they need some research assistance. Um, so it, it may be things like data collection, data, data cleaning, maybe some uh, introductory statistical analysis, something like that. Um, and we, we basically put a list of proposals together um, and then undergraduates who are interested in getting a research experience apply for this program. Um, and there's a selection process where, where we pick the most qualified undergraduates and we, we try and pair them um, from their interests to, to what the projects are. Um, so we've been able to support approximately 10 of these projects per semester. Um, and it's relatively cheap. Um, we basically provide each student with a $250 scholarship for completing the apprenticeship. Um, so there's the trickle down directly to the undergrads. Um, the graduate students also get this trickle down effect of essentially getting research assistance that otherwise they could not afford to pay for themselves. Um, so it allows them to work on more things. Um, this, this initiative has been super popular. Um, we've, we've gotten undergraduates something like 50 have been applying per semester. So we don't have enough of these opportunities. We're looking for a way to scale it. Um, so the multiplier effect that we've had is this program is, it really resonates with our, our, our alumni, especially those who wish they had had a research experience. Um, so just as one example, um, I posted on LinkedIn, <clears throat> maybe three weeks ago uh, about this program. I basically said what the cost per student was. Uh, and within two weeks, we had $2,000 in gifts just to support this program, right? So that's, that's gonna support another eight students. Um, our current graduate students are also putting together their own fundraising campaign. I think that's probably gonna raise more on the order of $10,000. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that from, basically seed funding that came out of this Murray S. Johnson chair. Um, and again, not that much money. So we, we started with just like $2,000 that first year. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's gonna blow up a little bit, uh, at least to five figures. Yeah, that's great, great. So if, uh, if Murray Johnson were here today, what would you wanna say to him about the endowment given what you've shared with us? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I would thank 
the Johnsons for their generosity. Um, so Murray, Murray S. Johnson was actually not even an economics graduate. He, he was a graduate of the business school, um, but he, um, he understood the value of economics from decades of working in the oil industry. Um, so he, he and his wife uh, were big philanthropists in the Dallas area. Um, and he thought it was very important uh, not only to support UT, but to do so in a way that helped students better understand economics and also to advance economics research. Um, and he, he actually passed away in, in 1989, I believe it was. Um, so one, one of the great things about being a holder of a professorship is that I've been able to provide basically annual updates to the family of Murray S. Johnson. Um, so they, they can consistently see the impact of that gift. Um, so Jean passed away in 2017, um, but prior to that, I, I was writing letters directly to her where she could see exactly how this gift was, was still making an impact. That's great, thanks so much. Well, let's start off with some questions that uh, we have a number that have come in. Uh, the first one is actually for uh, Austin. Austin, um, can you talk at all about how, it, with, about how the, I mean, the breadth, uh, but, but specifically the well-structured core liberal education spanning the arts, sciences, and humanities helped your plan two education? Well, um, I'm, uh, you might know I'm on the board of St. John's College in Annapolis and Santa Fe, which is uh, came out of the same 1930s University of Chicago movement to build um, a true liberal arts education. And that's what plan two also came out of, which is to be a well-educated, broad individual, you need true liberal arts, which is arts, sciences, humanities, philosophy, and learn to integrate those because I think, uh, in, in fact, I recommend to everybody the book Range. Uh, you know, why, uh, why specialists don't do as well as uh, uh, broader, broader educated uh, folks in, uh, particularly in Silicon Valley and other uh, pursuits. And it, it's because if you kind of think of a problem as uh, multidimensional, if your education just comes from one area, I mean, I've I love accountants. I've worked with a lot of accountants, but accountants see every problem as an accounting problem. And, uh, you know, engineers see it as an engineering problem. And the, the answer is problems aren't that neatly packaged and understanding you kind of have to think of it as something you can rotate and look at from different points of view. And the one thing you learn in business is the longer you are in business and the higher your level of involvement, the more your fundamental issue is people. And uh, humanities teaches you a lot about the fundamental nature of humans. And uh, so that's critical. So that combined with analytical skills really gives you the ability to sort of look at problems from different ways. And as uh, you know, finds the new approach that lets you do something or solve a problem in a way that uh, nobody else would. And I know that Jason and the, the folks in the economics department, that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to look at a new problem and find a new solution for it. And uh, collaborative teams that work across disciplines often are the best at that. Thank you. Uh, the next question, I think I will toss to my colleague, Michelle. Uh, Michelle, uh, for the challenging, for the legacy challenge, do, uh, if someone has already documented their playing gift with us, does that count? And what about, uh, a separate question, what about uh, donations that are contingent in one's will? Sure. So if you've already documented your planned gift, unfortunately, that wouldn't count specifically for this challenge. The goal here is really to get people who have not gotten to the stage of documenting to feel comfortable to do so. However, if you've already documented a gift and you believe that the value of that gift has increased by $100,000 or more, that increase would count. So there's that option. Or if, as you've been hearing everybody talk, you, you're feeling really motivated to do a new gift, that would also count. And as far as, and, and Tony, I'm sorry, can you remind me, what was the second question? 
contingent gifts. Sure. Are we able to so count the very this? nature of most planned gifts is that they're contingent. As Tony started this conversation early, we certainly understand that life changes, things happen. Um, really, our goal here is to have you tell us, look, it's my intention to put you in my estate. And I'd really, we would like that to be documented. So if we have that in writing and even it's a, yeah, yes, they would otherwise count. One, well, just one further note on our ability to count contingent gifts. Uh, you know, if, if it is contingent in, in the sense that um, if this person, you know, UT will get this gift if all of these other people pass away first, then oh. we're not able to count that that sort of contingent gift. Yes, I apologize. But, I think no, I misinterpreted no, the question a little uh, bit. <laughs> but uh, yes, there, there's definitely true that the, the future is always contingent, isn't it? Um, next question is for, uh, let's see. Why is it important to document my estate gift if I, if I already have it in my will? How does that change things? Um, I'll take a swing at this, if you don't mind, Michelle. Uh, there's a numerous reasons. As I said earlier, if you document your gift, um, then it's because you feel passionately about something at UT. And when you document your gift, it's, it's a mark of strong support for that area that you're documenting it for. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing that's probably most important, well, two more things. Two is Michelle and I, um, we're pretty good at our jobs. Uh, and so one of our jobs is to help people find the smartest way to make a gift. And so it is not unusual for us to review someone's gift plan, what the way they've laid out something, and for us to find, well, there's a much better way for you to make this gift. There's a way that you can save your, your family a lot of money in taxes. There's a way that you can deal with this asset that is going to be a big, a big hassle for, some, for people on down the line that the university can use as a gift. Um, there's ways to create income for people that you care about, you know, all these sorts of uh, things that Michelle and I are here to help you with. Um, the, uh, uh, that, that's, that's something that we can do. But I think probably the most important um, thing that we can do, reason is that we want to make sure that we get your gift right when it does pass to us. Um, you know, when an estate gift passes to us, you're no longer here to tell us what your intention was. And so we have to work with the documentation we have. And not every will is as detailed as it could or should be. And not every will, um, you know, not every donor has gone into the depth of thought about what they, what they want their gift to do. Well, we want to go through that thought process with you to make sure that you're achieving the change that you want to see at UT. And so that I think is probably the most important part. Um, Let's see, I will ask, oh, uh, here's one for Austin. Uh, I think that you've probably touched on a bit of this, but um, how did your plan to, how did plan to prepare you for success as an entrepreneur? And can you uh, specifically, uh, what about your study abroad experience? Uh, so, uh, and I apologize, I'm at my son's house and they're putting in a gutter. So I apologize for any noise. Um, let me talk about the, the uh, study abroad program. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned briefly, uh, the first money I gave to UT was to fund study abroad for other Plan 2 students for four years. Um, it was a, a time-limited gift, all had to be spent in four years, and, and virtually every Plan 2 student was able to get uh, an overseas experience. For me, it was transformational. It's probably the single most important year I spent in my life, even though I didn't study business. I, I actually found out there were there were real communists and Marxists in the world at, in the university I was in in South America at that time. So it was eye opening. But the main thing was it, it made me a much broader person. And I learned fluent Spanish. And it turned out I had no intention of ever going into business. But the chance to broaden my perspective, build a desire to work overseas and learn Spanish years later when BC, uh, Boston Consulting Group wanted to hire me to go to either Boston or San Francisco, and my girlfriend wanted to go to London. I said, can I go to London? And they said, we have four spots. Uh, three go to Cambridge and Oxford graduates. We hire one American. Why would we hire a guy from West Texas who's never been to England? And oh, by the way, do you speak Spanish? Because uh, we have a bunch of Spanish work. 
And so something I did is almost a hippie plan two student turned out to be the core to getting uh, the job that really was the rocket fuel for uh, my career to take off. So what, what I tell people is um, it, uh, the thing about breath is, I mean, some of the most capable and able people I know studied logic and uh, somebody who's really good at logic can be a great computer programmer. They can great be a, uh, they can, they can master almost any area of math. So what matters most is focus intently on what you do to really get some value. And if you have the chance to go live and work in a developing country, that just multiplies by 10. Uh, learning an extra language is the icing on the cake. So that's the, and, and all of those were kind of the capstone of my plan two career, if you will. Thank you, excellent. Um, uh, there, there's a question in the chat uh, regarding if I've documented my, uh, my estate, uh, my gift from UT as a percentage of my estate, uh, and the value of that percentage has increased. Can I redocument and have that count as the as, as for towards the legacy challenge? If the value and, and the answer is yes, if the value has increased and we're we're trying to keep to this rubric of an increase of hundred thousand dollars or more, then it will qualify, and we'd be delighted to uh, include you in this challenge and and to set aside those funds for you. If it's not quite there, uh, then. Um, you can still, you know, re, you know, uh, redocument, and we'd still love to know about your updates, uh, and those are appreciated as well. Uh, I'm going to ask Michelle. Um, can you tell us about how we recognize our uh, our gift planning donors who tell us that they've listed us in their estate? Sure, absolutely. So we have a couple of ways we do this. Obviously, one, you're going to get an enormous number of thanks from your program, from Tony and I, from all over the university, because it, it is really transformative, and we want to be mindful of that. You can also become a member of our Texas Leadership Society, which is a group uh, of people who've documented planned gifts. And that comes with special invitations and activities. It's a special notation in different areas, like in our annual report, on our website, and places across campus that we recognize this group who's made donations via this route. You can also do a named endowment. So for instance, um, we'll use my mom, who was an English major. If I left a large gift in my estate and documented it, and it was high enough, I could then have the Nancy Normile College Nancy Normal Scholarship for English majors, which would you know make her over the moon. You're not limited in how you name those. Those could be named after you. They can. We've had several people do them for family members. Um, you know, there's a lot of flexibility within certain parameters, and that's those are sort of the big key ones. Thank you, uh, Jason. I have a or Dr. Abravea, pardon me. Uh, question for you. Um, once I find it again, it slipped away from me. Uh, what has been your greatest achievement in your career at UT Austin thus far? And what, is the, what are the department's greatest needs right now? Uh, so that's a good question. Um, so I, probably the, the two things, and I'll just talk about one of them, the, the two things I'm probably most proud of as chair, um, partly because they took the most work and they both started from nothing, um, would be our master's program, which, which we created from scratch. Um, and then also all of the alumni relations we've done. Um, so I'll talk about the alumni relations since that, that seems more relevant <laughs> for the audience today. <clears throat> um, at the department level, uh, when I started as chair, we, we really had no engagement with alumni whatsoever. Um, obviously the university through Texas Exus um, and then the college would, would have engagement with alumni, but, but nothing more locally. Um, so we started, um, we started small, we actually printed a magazine for a few years, just, just to sort of kick things off. We mailed out thousands of these, we brought them to visit with alumni. Um, we, we got all of these great stories, people who had graduated 50 years ago said, wow, this is the first time I'm hearing from the economics <laughs> department, this is great. Um, so. That was fantastic. Um, I also think it's, you know, it's part of our mission to to really tell our alumni what we're up to. I mean, they 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 are part of this institution. They went through it. I think we owe it to them as a public institution to uh, keep them informed. Um, and what has come out of this has just been amazing. 
Um, it took us a few years to start an advisory committee. Um, it, we have about 35 members now. Uh, we started with, I think it was 22. Uh, we thought we would need to ask like 70 of our alumni to get a yield of 20. Um, but literally every single person we asked um, said yes, we'd, we'd love to get involved. We want to figure out how to give back. Um, and it just, it hasn't just been a nominal thing. Um, they've really made an impact. Um, they actually created their own professorship. Um, that was the first uh, sort of giving initiative um, from our advisory committee. Um, but then also um, they completely created an alumni mentoring network, uh, which has had direct impact on students. I think we're up to 50 one-on-one -on -one mentorship pairs uh, this year. Um, and then they, they've also been involved coming back to campus and, and participating on Zoom calls uh, with our career prep course directly. Um, and that's been very exciting. Um, and I think probably uh, it's, it's also happening in other parts of the college through the career prep course. But I think it's a really great way for alumni to get engaged because they, they can offer expertise that, you know, certainly me sitting in the ivory tower like i can't i can't tell a student like what what the financial industry is really like or the investment banking industry is really like or austin could come and and tell like what what are the struggles to get a startup off the ground um so that that really has been the most fulfilling um and you know hopefully it's gonna have long lasting impacts uh once i'm once i'm done as chair as well Thank you, uh, Dr. Abrevea. Um, there are two more questions. One that I will answer myself uh, with the question of what kinds of things can be done with a gift plan uh, or a plan gift like this, a gift through your estate. Uh, so there's, you can direct a, a, a gift through your estate to immediate use, uh, to current use. So it can be used in that way for whatever the highest purposes are this year right now. Uh, generally, people will establish uh, endowments through their plan gifts. And endowments generally come in three varieties. One is faculty support um, and things like professorships and chairs and research funds. Uh, another one is uh, student support. Um, that's scholarships, undergraduate scholarships, uh, graduate, uh, graduate fellowships and uh, funds that enhance uh, students' ability to take advantage of things like study abroad that uh, many of our students who have uh, come from more challenged socioeconomic backgrounds have a harder time taking advantage of. And then uh, the other one is uh, programmatic funds. Uh, we call them excellence funds, and they are sort of a, a multi-tool. A multi um, you talk to us about what impact you want to have, and we will do our best to put, doubt that, put together an endowment that describes the impact and the, the uses of those funds, and we create that endowment for you. Um, so those, those are the general uh, uses for a gift plan. Uh, the last two questions I have are actually for Dean Stevens. Uh, Dean Stevens, um, one question is, what are your funding priorities? And the other question is, are there, is there any thought of supporting student projects and curricula that are specifically multidisciplinary, working at the intersection of different fields with different insights on a common question? Uh, thanks. Both of those questions are, are important. The, the first, in some sense, will be quick for me to answer because we've really covered a lot of that. And that is, you know, the real priorities for support in the college we've talked a lot about today. Um, certainly student support, scholarships over the past year, that has been really critical as many of our students and their families have faced obstacles. So that's always important. Faculty support, again, we've talked about the need to support faculty research, make it as, as Jason put so well, so that they can focus on the research instead of having to focus on raising money to purchase data, equipment, um, and, and also to attract, continue to attract the best faculty. That support is crucial. Um, a final, uh, well, uh, two, two other things. Graduate student support, again, we've talked about that connects to the excellence of faculty as well as to the excellence of the undergraduate experience because our graduate students also work with undergraduates. Final form of, of student support is really in continuing to develop our career support for liberal arts students. 
building a system so that they start to understand early on where their liberal arts degree will take them and exposing them to alumni who have gone out into the world and, and get them started on understanding all the possibilities. Um, and so investments in that are something that we're particularly looking for right now to expand that. Um, this, I love the question on uh, interdisciplinary projects and, and for students and others. And that's something that um, I very, feel very strongly about. My, in my past life, I was running an interdisciplinary research center, which was really a joy. So for uh, students participating in interdisciplinary research or projects in the college, there's a number of avenues. A lot of the interdisciplinary work in the college happens through some of our major centers or institutes. So for example, the Humanities Institute has uh, themes that will often rotate over a few years. They've done a lot of work on medical humanities where they're reaching out to faculty and natural science and Dell Medical School, as well as in the English department or the psychology department within the college to um, really have an interdisciplinary experience. And many of those programs involve undergraduate and graduate students. Similarly, places like the Population Studies Center is really where social scientists of all different types and disciplines come together and work on topics like aging, uh, child development, those sorts of things. Center for Mexican American Studies, the Warfield Center, all of these are really hubs for that type of, type of activity. We also have within the college four interdisciplinary undergraduate majors, which I'll just be quick about. I know we're running short on time. We have human dimensions of organizations. We have international relations and globalization, health and society, and finally a sustainability measure. Those have emerged as some of our most popular majors. They really focus on areas or problems and bring an interdisciplinary faculty mix and approach. So those are all programs that um, are inter interdisciplinary and directly touch students. Um, so I will, uh, you know, we're really trying to support these efforts. We are working on a new seed funding uh, program within the college. And one of the categories will be interdisciplinary work where you might need a little bit more support to connect with another faculty member outside your department or with graduate students outside. So it's, it's definitely a priority for us as well. Thank you, Dean Stevens. And thank you, Austin and Dr. Abrevea, and of course, Michelle. Uh, and especially a, a big thanks to everyone of you who are joining us today. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, Michelle, and thank you for your support of the College of Liberal Arts. And if you have any questions about, uh, you know, including the, the university in your estate plan, uh, how to make the smartest gift possible, or the COLA legacy uh, challenge, please don't hesitate to reach out to Michelle or I. Uh, you can do that. Uh, we'll be sending out emails as, with, uh, as a follow-up, and then also you can uh, follow the link that we posted in the chat to the, to the landing page for the COLA Legacy Challenge. Appreciate you all attending today, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Welcome. Thanks, everyone.